I'm James Fiesel, uh, Headquarters, 23rd Tank Battalion. This is October the 3rd, 2001. When the... Uh, Just let us know how you got started in as well. Oh, uh, when the Japanese struck Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, I was a junior in high school in my hometown of Wood River, Illinois. Uh, and I finished uh, my schooling then in June of 43, was still just 18 years old, and had promised my parents that I would wait to be called, <laughs> which uh, occurred shortly after my August birthday. Uh, by that time, I had uh, taken a job in a local Laclede Steel Company mill, and they wanted to defer me, but I declined gung-ho to go do my part. <laughs> so uh, I was ultimately inducted and wound up uh, for basic training in Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, armored training. Uh, when I finished basic, uh, it was about that time, as I understand, and looking back, they were preparing folks for the invasion of Normandy Beach. And uh, the doctor felt a, a sound in my chest. And he kept me there for observation. And I did some weevil vehicle school training. Um, in my look back at my history, that was perhaps my first reprieve because I did not have to land on the beach. Uh, ultimately, I was uh, cleared to for overseas and I was sent with a replacement group across the ocean to uh, England, and then immediately across the channel on an LST. And I did land on the beach. Fortunately, it was our beach <laughs> at that moment. It was just as muddy as those poor days that those boys had to do it under fire. Uh, but uh, after a miserable night, uh, we finally loaded on trucks and hauled forward. And of course, I spent Thanksgiving of 1944 uh, somewhere in France uh, in a Frenchman's uh, home. And I was deathly sick with a cold. And so he cured me with a fiery snops. Life was getting interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, early in December, I reached the 12th Armored Division in the, the Alsace region where they had arrived at well, that time. Had just had their initial combat, had just lost their battalion commander, uh, Colonel Meigs. I was assigned to the tank crew of his S3 officer. And uh, we then had a few days of rest and recuperation when they were getting the other people recovered from the ambush that had caused his death. And then uh, we uh, began to attack some towns in the vicinity of Hurlishan, where uh, our 12th Armored story says we had our toughest battles in uh, first trying to take Hurlesheim and then trying to defend the area from the Germans trying to break out to re-encircle Strasbourg. Uh, my personal history at those times was fairly innocent. The S3 officer, perhaps uh, in a backlash from what had occurred earlier, uh, was not taking his front, his tank Right, right to the battle. But we did stand oftentimes just on the outskirts as radio relay and so forth. And then we were sent down to what was known as the Colmar Pocket. pocket. And uh, there we eventually circled up with the French First Army, I believe it was, to close the, the gap on the last remaining German stronghold 
west of the uh, Rhine River at that point. That is in the in the French sector. Uh, after many days here, and uh, finally we were relieved, and there was some rest and recuperation time. I remember actually seeing the USO in Nancy, France, early in February of '45. Uh, but then we were called back, and it was shortly after that that we were told that uh, we should strip all identity from the vehicles that we were now an unknown of uh, later given the name the Mystery Division. We were sent to uh, the Third Army from our position with the Seventh. We were sent to the Patton's Third Army and he gave us this assignment to kick off from Trier uh, with the intent to get a bridge before it was blown at, hopefully at Worms. Uh, so on the 18th of uh, March, 45, we uh, kicked off from Trier, driving uh, almost as hard as we could go in single column file, each little town. We'd leave some infantry to scrub the town, and we continued on. In this kind of march, and oftentimes in our night marches, the bat I would be the third tank in line. The battalion commander would have one light tank in front of him, his tank, and then the S3 tank, which I belonged with. At this moment, I was riding the bow gun position of the S3 tank, and uh, as I say, several little towns, we'd scatter a little fire, rush on through it full tilt, leave some infantry. All of a sudden, we drove through three little towns, and I looked around and I said, there's not even a dog out, there's not a chicken out, there's nobody to be seen, this is not good. <laughs> Major Schrader, who was our S3 officer at that time, was actually standing in the turret of the commander's tank. They often did this so that they were shoulder to shoulder communicating firsthand. We come around another little hillside into this town, and the light tank must have observed something that was wrong, and he stopped. So the columns, bang, 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 all stopped. And about that moment, uh, an armor-piercing shell crashed into the embankment, right, went right in front of my nose and into the embankment to my right. And of course, it was kind of a wake-up to all of us, and you can only go forward quickly. You don't want to turn your tail to guns. So we started on, and uh, apparently the next shell that that gunner or that loader had loaded in what I thought was an 88 at the time, struck our tank on the left side. But as I will observe later, it was a high explosive shell and it just ripped all the tread off the support system. But it didn't enter the tank as that first shell would have. Uh, we were knocked out, the tank jumped off the edge of the road and I told the crew, I said, now that gun's over here, let's keep this tank between us and that gun position see if we can crawl back around. So we spent the rest of the afternoon eating dirt as we were trained, and suddenly, and I was leading the troops, suddenly there was a pair of black boots standing right in front of my nose. <laughs> I followed that up to a Tommy gun in an officer's hand, and he said, surrender Americans, you're my prisoners. I said, yes sir, you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there was probably, I'd say, at least three crews of, of we Americans in that field at that moment uh, taking their cue from me. <laughs> our, uh, our gunner received uh, a machine gun because they did strafe at us with machine gun fire. He was struck in the shoulder. Uh, 
most of the rest of us that I know anything about, and there were probably 10 or 12 of us at least, uh, sort of rounded up and we were marched into this little town and put into a, what was a, believed to be a little two-room school. Our, our troops uh, rounded, rounded up support and during the night there was heavy artillery fire on the town and the Germans finally abandoned us and just took care of themselves. And so as daylight broke, we heard our infantry pop up and then we knew it was our troops coming into town. We identified ourselves and they told us that they'd cleared that end of town and we could march back the way we had basically come in. And I found a battalion command tank right at the edge of town where it had been struck with Panzerfaust. And then I uh, found our tank shortly behind it and discovered at that point that it had also been hit by Panzerfaust in the final drive gear right near my feet. So, as I tell my story, I was reprieved from the Normandy invasion and at this moment I had escaped because they missed me with the armor piercing, they missed me with the Panzerfaust. Uh, so uh, we were pulled back uh, within two, two or three days' time. Our S-3 tank had been repaired and rebuilt. And I was given basically command, told I would be the driver of that tank. And the driver who had survived with me was moved up to the battalion command tank. Uh, because we had, as I said, we lost our gunner wounded. Uh, the battalion command lost their driver, uh, lost their uh, bow gunner to an injury. Uh, they lost their loader, as I understand it, I think to death. Uh, so we had to kind of regroup the headquarters tank group. And from that point, uh, oh yes, and uh, we lost both uh, general Colonel Allen, or not Colonel Allen. We lost our battalion commander and our S3 officer, uh, Schrader. Uh, they were both wounded, we thought dead. We found out years later that they had survived their wounds. And, and uh, uh, but at any rate, we continued. To, uh, I continued with the 12th Armored. When we got to Worms, the, the bridge had been blown, and we had to wait until they got the pontoon bridge across the Rhine. When they did, I drove that tank across the pontoon bridge across the Rhine River. And uh, a few days later, uh, I think our Wurzburg was our next objective, and we went to that area. A few days later, my battalion officer said, Jim, get in the Jeep, we're going to go get a new tank. <laughs> so from that point, uh, I drove one of the hottest, uh, latest version uh, M, uh, 4A3 E8 Sherman tanks uh, across Germany from the basic Würzburg area all the way into Austria. Uh, as you've heard from many other stories, uh, liberated concentration camps liberated many of our own, captured. Uh, but in all my good grace, the good Lord brought me through it basically without a scratch. And I'm to him daily. Uh, Brent, where do I go from here? Well, what do you remember about your training? I remember in my training, and I remember this about my training, I'm still thin. But I went in probably an inch or so shorter. I think I must have still been growing. Maybe not. But very thin. I think I weighed 137 pounds. 
uh, it wasn't too long. With the Army getting me out, making me do calisthenics and, and doing five-mile hikes and all these kind of things, ate anything that came to me. <laughs> and they actually bulked me up to about 158 to 60 pounds. Uh, the uh, five-mile hikes up those mountains of uh, Fort Knox, they were brutal. <laughs> Crawling under machine gun fire was not fun. But there it was that day that I remember that I learned to try to crawl under machine gun fire. <laughs> uh, and uh, I enjoyed the uh, extended three months or six weeks, whatever it was there, where they taught me a lot of the mechanics end of the armored vehicles. So. And, uh, oh, I will remember this. While at uh, uh, Fort Knox, uh, we we'll often would have a weekend pass. Early in the game, I was at a U.S. O show, or U.S. whatever, and I met a one of the uh, uh, escorts uh, of the young ladies, who was actually just a young woman herself, I think in her mid-twenties or something. Uh, she did have a couple of children. Uh, but at any rate, uh, after my initial basic training, my dear parents had allowed me to take an automobile to camp. And so I and about four, three of my buddies would go into town and we'd call Nancy Lodwick and she would make sure we had dates. <laughs> and it was a fun side of those early days, and it really was. She and her husband practically treated the four of us like we were part of the family. I have seen Nancy since the war on several occasions. Uh, her husband has passed away. Her son is in the military, in the Air Corps, I believe. And uh, she was still getting along with her life in her 80s here in the past few years. Those were interesting memories. What did you like the very least about your training? Well, the thing that I think I liked the very least about it was on some of those attacks, I would be with behind that 30 caliber machine gun with the intent to keep down the enemy. I hated to aim it at any human being. I would sometimes <laughs> direct it in the vicinity and kind of purposely avoid killing. Probably was the thing I hated the most. I know when that officer took us prisoners, I said, fellas, we're fortunate because he knows that tomorrow he may be looking at our gun again. Let's be decent now. Let's be decent then. Try to inject some humanity into an inhuman situation. And you said that they, after the doctor, if I understood you correctly, after the doctor took you behind, they, that's when they trained you in the, the uh, track and wheel vehicles, is that correct? Yeah, they called that a wheel vehicle mechanics training. Had you been trained in just and infantry was, prior to that? Well, I was trained to. Uh, Repack uh, wheel hubs on the front wheels of half tracks. I was trained to put treads back on on track vehicles and uh, mm -hmm. perhaps other things that I don't even remember. And you went over as a replacement in the Rebel Depot, is that right? I I did. I I left the states not knowing, you know, who I was. I had actually spent some time in Arkansas doing field maneuvers uh, 
at Camp Chaffee, Arkansas, but uh, never did I feel assigned to anything as big as a battalion even uh, for any permanent feature until, and I, I've often tried to recall back whether it was on the boat, whether it was on a pickup, no, I, six by six uh, in France, that somebody handed me patches with the 12th Armored label and said, sew them on, you're, you're now 12th Armored. Uh, but it happened, and uh, as we all do, we were issued a little packet of threads so we could do, take care of those details. Yeah. And as I said, uh, tried to think of the name of the town where General Miggs was killed. Uh, that's where I found the battalion. What do you remember of your uh, time in transit over there? Mostly just in the boat? Or? You know, again, I recall in, in, in transit on one of these uh, uh, the Liberty, they call them, you know, built for the troop carrying positions that here we were young bucks, the, the few fellows that I was still friendly with and so forth, and we hit one storm when the waves were breaking clear over the bow of the ship, you see. And we said, let's run up there and let's watch that wave come up the bow and then we'll duck under. And that's what we did. We went up there and we'd peek over and watch that wave come washing up the bow and then we'd duck under the, the keel or whatever they call it, you know, and let that water break clear over our head. Like, kids out of school, but uh, there were moments of, of happiness, the moments of comradeship. There were moments out there I often tried to remember. Since I was basically in the, I'll say the front line from mid-December to uh, early February, uh, and uh, I would say, I don't know when the last time I washed. I don't know when I've had. I don't know when I've really changed shocks, socks for sure, but I did do that to carry a pair of socks in the tank. Those were days of terrible cold weather where we could almost freeze out there. A lot of fellows had frostbite and so forth from it. We felt there was some virtue in being inside that coffin. <laughs> uh, but there are things, moments later, when you think back, you say, you know, when did I taste real food, ate sea rations, when I could find something to light a little fire under it, you see, or the rest of the time there were K rations, you know, and happy as a lark to have it. But uh, we made a habit of carrying uh, rations, a case of rations on our back deck, because we would often find infantry who didn't even have that. And we'd pass it out. So what's your, think, uh, thinking back on it, the first day, first minute you walk up on the 12th that you're a part of it, what do you remember about that time? What I remember about that day is that uh, introduced because the battalion headquarters tank was two tanks. And so I was introduced to basically seven other people and uh, maybe an officer or two. And I remember that first day that the gunner in that headquarters tank was still cleaning the remains of battalion commander. That was a brutal, that was my first brutal shock and awakening to hear the story, to recognize what was taking place, what had to happen. Uh, the thing I often remember about that young gunner, his name was uh, Alvin Wolke. As nice a young man who probably was just a year or two older than I was, as I think I had met anywhere along the line. And he survived many instances. This one, he survived that day when I was captured and continued as the battalion command gunner until 
one week before the armistice, he was killed. He was killed outside of the tank when a mortar fire caught him. And you regret anybody who you knew to have been killed, but he was one that really bothered me. I had hoped so much that he would get home. I had hoped to find family that I could talk to. To this day, I have not been able to. What images stick out in your mind of that period after arriving there and starting to join the 12? Well, um, I think one of the early realizations is that, again, I had been fortunate in the pick. Uh, hopefully, somebody read my grade report or my uh, tank, my uh, tests, whatever they were, that uh, said he's not a total dummy. <laughs> and uh, may have led to my assignment to, to battalion headquarters crew. And as I have said, sometimes that kept me a little bit off the edge of the tough fighting, which was naturally a poss possible blessing. Uh, oftentimes in the attack mode, it right on the point. Uh, but. Uh, it was pleasant and grateful to feel like that maybe I was worth something and that somebody had felt so. What, uh, what do you think you've carried with you the most? What experience affected you the most if there was one or any group of things that happened or you did? Well, I, I guess the thing that affected me most and I have spoken on occasions. Uh, uh, I go to a local high school in our town of Decatur, Alabama, when they have their history day and invite the military uh, in to witness and to sit with the students. And I basically try to tell them the most atrocious thing that happened was that the German people allowed a bad political scene to develop. And that I think that we as citizens need to be pretty well awake to what our politicians really are getting us into, how, where they really are leading us. Uh, I think that's important. How much interaction did you have with any of the German citizens given the time that you were there? Well, uh, I didn't stay, but just a very short period after the armistice because I was a low pointer and I was shortly shipped uh, back intending to be sent to Japan, you know, to the Pacific area. But on one assignment when I was an escort for a radio half track because our battalion headquarters had to put us out on a hillside, uh, we remember sitting there, you might say fraternizing with the local youth who would come out to explore the area and they've had a swimming pond across from our, where we set up. What I have experienced since of, of German folks is I've been back to Germany twice. I've gone on two retours of our basic areas. On the second opportunity, I was allowed to get back to the little town where I had been captured with the help of a young lady by the name of Lise Pamois, who's an author of much of our history, of our Alsace endeavors, and she personally escorted me into that town. And when we got there, I asked somebody on the street, where is the little old schoolhouse? And when she pointed to the wrong building, I said, no, no, older. She said, go to second house. So I headed in the direction, and when I walked up the driveway, there was an elderly woman and man there and a younger 
lady. And I said, is there anyone here that can speak to me in English? And the young girl said, what do you wish to know? <laughs> Those people, when I told them that I had been briefly a prisoner of war, American troops in their town, sit me and my wife down and Lise Pama, and we conversed about that day in their life and in ours, and they were very hospitable. They led me to the building where I had been held, and I have a picture taken five years ago, standing by that building, which had changed and currently a, a bank building at that point. But I found the people very warm and civil about it all. On another occasion, on that flight home, I believe it was, when we had to fly from Stuttgart to Paris, Alice and I were sitting with a German on the aisle. We were chatting as we do it about our experiences. And at one point, this fellow turned to me and he said, may I shake your hand? I want to thank you for giving me a life. I've, I've run into people who felt that way about it. Actually, we were a salvation to many of them. How long did you stay after Armistice there? That had become vague to me, but uh, what I do recall is that uh, whatever three weeks or so uh, we spent actually on the water occurred at both my birthday, which was August the 15th. I was on that ship headed for the States, and I think it was very close to that 16th or so that the Japanese uh, surrendered, uh, and so we were diverted I think in our path, uh, landed in New York Harbor and uh, were then trained back to our individual states, as I recall, because I was sent to Illinois and uh, spent more time because they didn't release me until March of 46, working in the camp uh, Grant, I believe it is, near Chicago. What do you remember about the, that, the day that you diverted over and you pulled up into New York Harbor? Oh, party time. You know, you know one of those happiest days of your life. Uh, I'm going to go back a little bit because I have alluded to the fact that only by the grace of God and my sitting here have I been able to have a wonderful life, married a young lady after a, all of the war business was over, went to the university and got a degree, had a lovely career, you might say, as an engineer and a and staff member of, uh, of uh, my company, uh, which uh, was Amico Chemical. Uh, but back to those days of reprieve, such as the thing that allowed me to escape the Normandy landing, uh, diverted the shells that could have killed me. I had a sniper who drew a bead on my head, or in the mar night march I was driving the tank, sometime after we'd crossed the Rhine River. And there was a forest about 110 yards to our left, and we were in this column, light tank, battalion command tank, and then my tank, the S-3. And I heard the light tank rev his engine. To me, he's clear an engine, we're going to move out, and I can't let those cat eyes get away from me. And I threw my weight into the gear shift. Bullet went behind my head. The tank behind me, who I wished I could identify, detected that sniper fire would have killed me without doubt. But something told me to move. So that's at least the third of three or four instances 
which I said, I believe the good Lord had his hand <laughs> in my escapes. Uh, that basically, I think, wound up my career. I was brought back to the States. Uh, I guess I had some party time in New York. I know I had party time in Chicago. <laughs> and I was still single. And, and uh, so thoroughly enjoyed the party times that uh, the young American ladies were just as thrilled to have us back as we were thrilled to be here. <laughs> uh, and uh, then after that, uh, it was a case of turning my back on it. Uh, after the celebration is over, there comes the sudden realization of where you've been, what it's been. And I said, I've just got to put this as far behind me as I can. Which I did, and which also resulted in sort of intentional, some of it accidental, actually loss of memory of some things that occurred. And only after many years later, when I began to get curious, my buddies would talk about having reunions of their outfits, and I said, gee, I wonder if the 12th Armored ever has any reunions. And uh, I was passing through Louisville, and in fact, I called this dear Nancy Lodwick, and she said, Jim, on your way out, drive into the Patent Museum and to the library, and they'll help you out. I walked into there and I said, has the 12th Armored ever formed any reunion organization? And the librarian says, man, you have the best. <laughs> and so he put me in touch. And that was back in about 1989, I believe, that I did hook up with our 12th Armored Association. And I have been faithful to them since that time. You said you went to the Patent Museum. What do you remember of the time when you were part of, when, you were, when your unit was transferred over and the division became part of Patton's Army? And all the, uh, you alluded earlier to uh, having all the, uh, the uh, well, you see, removed. And they were, those were the orders that Patton felt like he could have a full division that the Germans would not identify, would not know they were even there, and, and that's the reason we night marched and had stripped all identity, and we became known as the Mystery Division. And we, I'm sure, with his own, in some parallel with his own troops and everything else, struck out. We, from the point of Trier, uh, headed to Worms. Uh, at some point, uh, I saw Patton cruised by in his personnel car. People have asked me, did you ever see him? Yeah. I said, well, no, I saw him go by. Uh, and uh, that's about it. Uh, I, I did, by grapevine, uh, read the reputation of the man. You know, we said, he has gone ho. He is going to let, take no excuses, you see. You're going to get out there and do it. Uh, and I think, he commended us for getting out there and doing it for him. What do you remember of that time period uh, around uh, the time that you were headed to Worms? Uh, what happened with the unit combat-wise, did you recall? Well, as I recall and was able to establish after my one night in captivity, uh, they had had two guns in place. Uh, on the, one of them in that hillside that I thought I could crawl around, and here I was crawling right towards that second gun emplacement that I didn't realize was there. But that gun had let us run past it and get closer to town, and then the gun on the left side also dug in as the one that had opened up on us. And uh, then with the column sitting there like so many ducks, this other gun had opened up on the back end of the column and I believe I personally counted something in the neighborhood of 20 to 23 of our Sherman tanks spread around, scattered out there in those fields, burned out, at least disabled. 
And uh, one of those pathetic mistakes, I had gone, when I come out of town, I went to the gun position that I thought had knocked us out, curious about it, and discovered two piles of ammunition, pile of AP, pile of HEs. And I said, I know that the orders had been to that loader, just keep alternating. The, the AP missed us, but probably because Gunner had allowed a little bit of windage because expecting us to be moving, he had to fire out a sitting as he missed us in front. He didn't miss us with the second shell, but it happened to be a high explosive. Uh, as I said, many of our tanks, very many of our A Company tanks, as I recall it, or I learned later, it was A Company behind us, disabled, uh, pretty well shot up. After that, uh, what combat did you see after you got back out of schoolhouse? Of the well, after that, the one combat incident that I remember is that uh, we had laid siege on some little town that was apparently sufficiently occupied that they were putting up some battle and they had some tanks in it. And the battalion, uh, well, the S3 officer in, in my tank had called for an airstrike. We were sitting out of town, kind of looking down at it, and he called for this airstrike. And uh, the airstrike didn't come to his satisfaction in time, and uh, the infantry trying to creep into town, or artillery fire on the town, or whatever, had influenced the Germans to pull out. So the German tanks pulled out, far side of tank, and he ordered us in. And so we got into the town, and about that moment, the P-52s had arrived for the airstrike. And I learned to respect them. They dropped out of those clouds, come whizzing over us, and dropped two torpedoes, two bombs. And I jumped into that tank and pulled a hatch. <laughs> And the S3 officer grabbed the telephone and said, call off that airstrike, call off that airstrike. Two of those planes dropped bombs. The third plane pulled up, never dropped anything. But I said, hey, we've got something I'm sure that our enemies will respect. This happened to me one time <laughs> when I was sitting in the wrong town. <laughs> I remember respecting the German gunners. The 88 gave it a lot of respect, mostly because of coming up on time. one of our vehicles. In one instance, I come up on a case where one of our Shermans had rounded a little curve and confronted dead on with a German Mark II. And we went up and counted three gouges in the front deck of that German tank. Nothing penetrated. That tank was sitting there because one of our other Germans had got to the flank and got him from the side. But that American Sherman had a whole front to back. One strike. One strike. Our gunner got off three in the time it took him to get off one. One outcounted all three of them. Uh, I think they were very good gunners. The, my first recollection of that was the early story about Colonel Miggs was that they had acquired one of our radios and they heard him command his troops that I'm waving my map board giving instructions. And they said, nail him. That's the man I want. They took him. They couldn't see the tank. They could just see his turret and him. And they got him. They're that good. Uh, I think, as I read 
read the history and books and as I see details and as I say, right? I think the Germans were superior to most of the other troops that they typically had to battle and they felt it and they believed it. Our Her Herlesheim experience, I know because some of our tr fellows had later gone, was able to encounter the uh, SS officer who was in command of one of those uh, panzer troops there at Herlesheim. And he said, you were the toughest shit we ever run into. He said, most people would have turned and run tail, and you wouldn't turn, you would not turn and run. What do you remember personally about the Hirschheim area? I didn't even know at the time how tough it was. Didn't even realize that we'd lost the 43rd Battalion practically in mass. Knew we had had some damage on our 23rd tank, some of our 23rd tank personnel. Had no recollection for the extent of it until I read literature later and when I went back to visit the area because I recall that our S3 officer at that, that moment was uh, Captain Comfort, a man that I dearly loved, respected him very much. I put his name on our S3 crew list out here because he was my pick of all I had known. And uh, he had left us sitting at the edge of Hurlesheim and literally walked in town with the company commander of C Company, I think, who was trying to lay siege on the town. <clears throat> and later I hear this story from the C Company commander that they were trying to get back out of town. They had basically moved their headquarters right in the, the town, and they knew they had to, had to pull out, and every time they'd go out the door, they'd hear the mortar uh, dropped into the tube, and they'd turn and run back in and the shell would land out there on their path. Uh, I think ultimately they decided if we can time this, we'll start out, they'll drop the shell, and as soon as it hits, we'll run because you've got to take time to load again. So the next shell caught behind them and injured, I think there was a lieutenant with this uh, uh, I don't know whether Comfort was still a captain or whether he had a higher rank at that time, but uh, Captain Garneau, who was C Company commander, and uh, Comfort, I think, was injured some, and I think the lieutenant was seriously injured. Uh, uh, but we had been set part far enough away that we were only just relaying radio messages for him and uh, never took a direct shot. You mentioned earlier that uh, you uh, moved on from there and uh, got to the point where you were involved in some of the uh, POW camps there in Germany and some of the liberation there. What can you tell me about uh, that, that time? Whether it was Dachau or, or which one precisely is say I, I do recall coming up, up on this camp so early in the situation that the Germans had literally just packed up and run, see, so off to leave them. Remember these emaciated skeletons, walking skeletons, approaching us. trying to be thankful to us, and then looking over and seeing all of the bodies who had been machine gunned or whatever, you see. Just a, a scene that, if you hadn't seen it, couldn't believe. And I understand there are people to this day in this country who don't believe it. You know, they think it's a story made up. It wasn't. It's true. And it was one of those horrors, 
of most horrible things. We run into some of our own 12th Armor who'd been captured at Hurlishan. So they had spent several months marching practically without food, just being scampered along from one little camp to someplace else. They also needed food. Uh, what images stand out the most from those times? Well, the image of the prisoners or the dead bodies in, in the, the concentration camps, uh, images of destruction which we had caused, horse-drawn ar artillery pieces where the artillery piece and the horses would lay dead where mostly our artillery had gotten to them. Uh, I remember a few instances of sitting above one of these towns you see and having to lay fire down at, at uh, basically withdrawing troops. Uh, I remember the Autobahn as one of the things that was most astonishing to me. We hit the Black Forest area and here was four-lane highway. I'd never seen a four-lane highway in my life. And uh, they would had used them. In fact, we saw their airplanes still parked in the trees where they had used that Autobahn as their runway strip. Uh, What is the strangest thing you, you saw during that, the oddest thing you know, that you recall? Anything uh, unexpected? Yes, I suppose it was the uh, European characteristic at that time to live under the same roof with their cattle. Their barn and their home was just one continuous situation. That was a little bit of a shock to me. Uh, the honey wagons that we used to call them hauling manure down the street was a little bit of a shock. Of all your time in service, what is probably your single fondest memory? Of all of my time in service, a single fondest memory. From training through combat, through getting back and being kicked out when you got in Chicago. Well, uh, as I said, some of the fond memories were those weeks that, uh, months that we spent uh, in the Louisville, uh, Fort Knox area, uh, where we would go dance with the young ladies, you see, and, and be a, a typical 18-year-old free and free white and, and not yet 21. <laughs> uh, and there were fond memories when I did get back and meet a few of those to, because our little group had intended and communicated for a reunion right there in Louisville. I did get back and I did see uh, Nancy and her family and I did get back to the home and see one of the girls I was most fond of and in fact almost at that moment almost became engaged to. <laughs> uh, but it didn't happen. Interestingly a few years later dear Nancy knowing that I had been fond of this girl said you know she has passed away and I think cancer took the young girl and probably her 50s, but uh, I was still seeing Nancy at those times. Uh, another pleasant moment is that when I got home and uh, enrolled in a local school, a university, to get my first year, uh, one of my uh, buddies who married the sister of my wife had said, Jim, come on and join the Marines. He'd been a Marine. Well, I was out of the Army. But he had hung in the Marine Reserve. He said, "Come join the Marine Reserve, and we'll go over to, El you know, to St. Louis, and and what they were doing is pre up, what do they call it, prepping the aircraft before the pilots would climb aboard and take off for their maneuvers." I said, "That sounds like good sport, you see," and 
And then I had made my application to the University of Illinois to make transfer. That transfer came through, and so after one year with the Marine Corps and flying to El Toro, I said, just give me my discharge. I'm going to have to go up to upstate, and uh, I don't want to come back down here. They gave me my discharge, which then allowed me to skip Korea. <laughs> I think I have just about covered everything. One little incident that was a, an amusing battle casualty sort of thing. Freezing cold weather when my little bow gunner, I can picture him to this day, he's small in comparison to me because I, I was six footer by then I suppose and carried my 160 pounds and he was probably five foot eight and uh, 125 or something. And, he was freezing cold and sitting in his bow gun position while we were trying to hold pressure on this town through the night. And we were sitting there and he crawled into his sleeping bag. How a person in one inside in a bow gun position. It took him, I know, 20 minutes or more. But he got in it and just got it zipped up and the Germans decided to lay some mortar fire on us. <laughs> and you would think that that mortar hit our back deck of that tank the way it sounded and the way we shook. And my little bow gunner was back out of that sleeping bag almost as fast as I could snap my fingers. <laughs> you know, I could look back at it and laugh, and I hope he still looks back at it and laughs. But we did survive that night and, and uh, several more. Uh, and I do recall poking my nose into Austria uh, and seeing some of the young Austrian girls come to greet us and welcome us. Uh, but you said it was real cold. Uh, tell, me, uh, tell me about the cold. That you well, see, we were going after we left uh, basically the Worms area. We were traveling south into Germany and. Uh, of course, I remember nights in January and, and uh, well, December and January, early in the game, how bitter cold it was. I, in one of those fortunate nights when I was not on the front line and they said, all right, headquarters, this is your billet, you know, this building is yours. And I went upstairs and here's a nice little feather bed, you see. And, with the window open, I crawled into that feather bed, and the next morning I awoke with snow on top of me, and the window open there next to me banked up with snow. It had snowed during the night, and I was snug as a bug under that feather quilt. Uh, other moments when we st would light anything that we could make t into a bonfire, you see, to, for warmth. Uh, run those tanks when we could <laughs> to warm up the engine, but most of the time when they run, they just pull cold air across you. Uh, it was bitter cold, but again, somehow or other, the blessings of youth and, and the decent conditioning, uh, uh, we just tolerated it. That's the way I look back at it, you know. We said, hey, I'm alive. I'm gonna rub my hands, I'm gonna rub my feet, you know going to go on. So do you think of anything else? I believe that's more than enough. All Thank right. you. Thank you, sir.